Thank you for joining us for this episode of Refresh, our online Bible study. If you're with us, then you got past the title of this, Thou Shalt Not Steal, and you got to thinking about it. Well, maybe I want to listen to this, but I'm not really a thief. I don't break into people's houses. I don't get into their car. I don't steal from them. I understand that. I think that probably 99.9% of the people who listen to Refresh week in and week out would certainly not classify themselves as thieves. But I want us to take this commandment in a gospel direction. As we've looked at with all of the commandments, there's a life principle behind these commandments. I believe God was getting at more than just how they should relate to each other and each other's possessions. Behind this, uh, I believe God is trying to teach us a healthy attitude about things and a faith and a trust in the God who provides for us what we need. So stay tuned. Maybe you're not a cat burglar. Maybe you don't break into houses and steal things or break into cars. But all of us would do well to think about our attitude about things and our trust in God. So I'm going to pray, and we're going to turn to Exodus chapter 20 and verse 15, and we're going to take a look at this matter of possessions and what God has provided. So join me as we pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for your word. Uh, thank you for the grace of our Savior, your Son, Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us and called us into his kingdom, placed us into your family, and given us a new life. Thank you for your Holy Spirit that dwells in us and empowers us to live the kind of life that you desire us to live, the Holy Spirit being our agent of sanctification to make us more and more like Jesus. So, Lord, I pray today that you would teach us from your word to trust you, to be content, uh, to be generous, and to recognize that you are the giver of all good things because you are a good God. For it's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Now, let's turn to our scriptures. Here's our scripture for this week, Exodus chapter 20, verse 15. So we said it's the eighth commandment. And very simply stated, you shall not steal. Now, it's very interesting. The word here for steal in the Old Testament carries with it kind of the attitude of deceit. Uh, it wasn't so much the um, just the blatant grabbing of something, although one of the ways this word is used quite often, it refers to kidnapping. Uh, not just kidnapping of persons, but I guess kidnapping of, of uh, possessions. But not just that kind of forceful taking, but also the more subtle kind of cheating someone out of something that's rightfully theirs. As I said in the introduction, there's a principle behind this. It's more than just the behavior, although the behavior in itself is important enough that we respect other people's property. But the principle behind this that I want us to work from today is this principle that I can trust that God has and will provide everything that I need. You see, that's what happens when we steal, when we, even if it's just something as seemingly innocent as taking things home from our work uh, that belong to our work and making them our own, you know, using them for ourselves, um, you know, or something as subtle as just seeing something laying by the side of the road and saying, well, you know, somebody left that there. Um, I guess they didn't want it, so I'll just take it. You see, stealing is any time we take something that does not belong to us. That's a very simple definition of it. We can try to explain it away. We can rationalize it. But if it doesn't belong to us, if it has not expressly been given to us, if we do not have permission to take it, or if we have not established ownership of it, and we take it, we're stealing. But behind the behavior, what is the attitude? What does, what does our constantly uh, feeling like we have to add to our collection of stuff say about our trust in God? And what does it say about how we value 
possessions. So the principle we're going to work from is that I can trust that God has and will provide everything I need. It's basically a gospel issue. We need to understand that God is good. God is good. We don't need to look elsewhere for our peace, for our satisfaction, for our our life. Um, we talk often, often about, I can't spell today, we talk about the sufficiency of Christ. My relationship with Jesus, it's not just that it's just enough. It is abundantly enough. Um, and so God is good, and what God has given me is sufficient and and exactly what I need for the day. We'll, we'll look at that a little bit more in depth. What I want us to do is I want us to consider three habits for a pure heart about possessions. Three habits for a pure heart about possessions. So the first one I want us to look at is to establish a healthy discipline of work, a healthy discipline of work. Look what Ephesians 4.28 says. Let the thief no longer steal, but rather, so this is a 180 degree alternative, but rather instead of stealing, let him labor, doing honest work with his own hands so that he may have something to share with anyone in need. In other words, the one who used to steal, rather than being a thief and rather than wanting to steal, wanting to take, how can we turn a take attitude into a give attitude? Notice the contrast is there. Don't steal, but instead share. What a tremendous, tremendous contrast that is when we when we steal. We demonstrate that we are lazy and that we are greedy. But when we work, it gives us an opportunity to show that we are diligent and we are generous. So the first place to start is to establish a healthy discipline of work. I'm blessed to be able to work at a place where I enjoy working, doing what I enjoy doing. I know not every one of you has that opportunity. Many of you who watch are, are retired, um, but those that do work, maybe your workplace isn't grand and glorious. Maybe what you do is, um, it really is a chore and it has become drudgery for you. But when we recognize that good, honest work glorifies God, when we're diligent in that, God is providing not just enough for us, but providing an abundance for us so that we can share. So the first place we start is by having a healthy discipline about work. The second habit to develop is to learn the practice of contentment, the practice of contentment. Philippians 4, 11 through 13. I'm going to spend a little bit of time here because I want to, I want to talk about context of Scripture. Um, now, what's happening in Philippians 4? Uh, Paul has started out this chapter talking about two women who were, you know, in Philippians, he talked about the two women who were feuding. He talked about let nothing be done through strife and vainglory. Of chapter 2, he talked about putting on the mind of Christ letting God uh, working out our salvation because of God working in us works through all of that. Uh, talks about his testimony in chapter three and, and wanting to know Christ and being found in him and striving for the upward call of God in Christ. In Philippians four though, he talks about the things that we think about, think about things that are true, honest, noble, just pure, lovely things that are um, of good report and virtuous and praiseworthy, to think on those kinds of things and to practice the example that they've seen in him. Then he turns to this level, uh, th this, this idea of contentment. Notice what he says in verse 11. 
Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned. Now, this is an important word here, this word, learn. Um, it's the Greek word, imiton, and it refers to learning something by experience. I've come to know over the course of time that in whatever situation I'm in, I can be content. Experience has taught me how to find contentment outside of circumstances. Or you might even say, in spite of circumstances. You know, a lot of us, and I'm, I'm, I had a situation this weekend where some circumstances kind of put me in a hardship. Um, I'll just go ahead, I'll take a moment to tell you about it. The battery in my truck died in a public parking lot on a hot, steamy Friday afternoon. Uh, I tried a couple of different ways to jumpstart it. Didn't have, I had, had everything I needed to jumpstart it. That didn't work. I had to call my daughter to come get me. I took her back to work, took her car, went home, got my tools. And I came back, um, fiddled with the battery a little bit, to just, but then just realized battery is dead. And so right there in the public's parking lot, I had to take the battery out, go down the road and buy another $200 battery and come back in the public's parking lot, put the battery in my truck. Hot, um, Let's just say I was probably not in one of my more jovial moods Friday afternoon. And as I got to thinking about that, I got to thinking about some other people that I know that are going through some circumstances that when compared to my little battery circumstance are much more severe. And God kind of put my little inconvenience in perspective God showed me that at least I could. I did have the tools. I did have the ability to take the battery out. It wasn't raining or storming Friday afternoon. Uh, there was an auto parts store a couple of miles down the road. They did have the battery that I needed. Um, I did have the the, the wherewithal uh, to be able to buy the battery that day. The money was in hand to buy the battery that day. And when I put it in, that did in fact work and everything is going fine. So I had to learn, and I learned, we learn through these experiences that we can have contentment outside of our circumstances. But too many of us, and, and I'm guilty of this, too many of us put the burden of our contentment onto our circumstances. But we live beyond our circumstances. We're children of the King if we're followers of Jesus Christ. God loves us. He is for us. Who can be against us? He who spared not his own son, Romans 8 tells us, how will he not uh, through him graciously give us all things? And we, we put things in perspective. So we need to learn to practice contentment, learn to find contentment in whatever situation we find ourselves. It is a learned behavior by experience. He goes on to say, though, in verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to be, uh, how to abound in any and every circumstance. Now, that kind of makes that comprehensive. In any, that's each specific one, and every, that is the collective. I have learned, there's our word again, but this is a different Greek word. This is Memuamai, we get our word memory from this, but this revert refers to discovering a hidden secret. And so Paul has said, in my experience, as I've worked on being content in the highs and the lows, in any and every circumstances, I've learned the secret. What is the secret? What is this hidden secret? Here it is in verse 13. I can do all things 
through him who strengthens me. Now, let me just take a minute and say, this is one of the most commonly, ver uh, verses the most commonly taken out of context. Verse 13 does not apply to, I can't just say I can do all things through Christ and all of a sudden uh, go out and run a five minute mile. I can't run a five minute mile. I, I don't know that I could run a five hour mile. I'm not sure I'd run a five day mile <laughs> at this point in, in, in my life. It's not a blank check to say, man, if I just claim it, I can do it. No, in its context, Paul is talking about living within whatever circumstance he finds himself. The strength of Christ is the secret sauce. Of contentment. You know, the Bible says that uh, when we are weak, he is strong. Paul said, talked about his thorn in the flesh. He said, because whenever he said, I'll rejoice all the more so in my weaknesses for when I'm weak, then he is strong. Um, when we are brought low, as Paul used the circumstance, uh, the, the terminology, we learn that we can still get by because Jesus fills up he is sufficient to fill up what we are lacking when we abound if we have the right attitude we recognize that we didn't we're not abounding because we're so great but we're abounding because god is blessing so when you think of philippians 4 13 i want you to start thinking about this practice of contentment not putting the burden of your contentment onto your circumstances, but recognizing that your circumstances, get this now, your circumstances have been ordered by a purposeful, and sovereign God. Those circumstances that you are bemoaning, those circumstances that you are angry about, that you are fretting over, God has allowed those circumstances in your life in order that he might be strong for you. That you can learn to be content because this situation I find myself in, is just an opportunity for God to show his glory. We, kind of a catchy way we like to say it. The test is going to lead to a testimony. And that's what he wants to do in your life. Well, then the third good habit for us to develop to have a healthy attitude about our possessions is trust the provision of God. Uh, in James chapter 1 and verses 16 and 17, James says, Do not be deceived, my beloved brothers. Deceived. Temptation. That's the context of what you get in James chapter 1. He's coming off of, let no one say when he's tempted, I'm tempted by God. God doesn't tempt anyone with evil, nor can God be tempted by evil. But he's talking about in our circumstances to give thanks because our circumstances are, are strengthening our faith and, and, and building steadfastness in us. That's the truth of it. But with God's truth about our circumstances, the devil tries to lie. And what does the devil, what is the devil's lie? That God is not good. That is a bald faced lie from the devil. Your circumstances, he will use your circumstances to try to tempt you that he's not good. Well, I don't, if I only had this, if I just had this possession or if I could just have this or if this bill could be paid off or if I had this kind of savings or if I knew my retirement would, would be sufficient and we get all down on our circumstances. James says that's the devil's deception. Why does he say that? Every good gift and every perfect gift. Now, there is a nuance to those two, but we'll get to that in a moment. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above 
not from our own, not from below, not from earth, from above. It is God given. It's coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. God doesn't fade. God doesn't um, ebb and flow. God doesn't wax and wane. Um, God is on his A game all the time. Good gift, when he says every good gift, that means that everything God has given is good. If you have it, it's good because it's come from God, and he wants you to know that. Perfect gift means that everything that is good, God has given you. Now, there's, there's a nuance in that. Everything you have is good for you to have or God would not have given it to you. And everything that is good for you, God has or will give it to you in his time, in the right time. So both the thing and the overall concept of goodness, God will see to it. Why? Because the devil's lie is a lie. God is good. You can trust the provision of God. So maybe you're not a thief. But why does a thief steal? A thief steals because there's something that thief doesn't have that he feels like he would like to have or would be good to have or nice to have or needs to have. We may not go that far with our discontentment about our possessions. But I want to challenge you. Enjoy your work. Even if you can't enjoy what you're doing in your work, enjoy that you are working. If you're retired, enjoy that you did work and that you could work and, and see in your work the work of God to enable you to provide for your family and to share with others and, and be generous. So develop a good work ethic. Don't, don't be afraid of work. Second thing I would encourage you to do is, is be grateful for what you have. Learn to be thankful. Rather than complaining about your circumstances, learn to be content. Well, you know what? I, right now, where I am, this is where God wants me to be. This is what God wants me to have. And so I'm going to be content in it. And then I would say, pray for what you need. And trust God's yes, no, or wait answer. And then finally, be generous. Um, don't be... Uh, don't be a pond that gets stagnant because the water never flows from it. Uh, be a flowing stream where fresh water, fresh blessing from God is constantly flowing in and you from what God is giving you is flowing out and you are using it to bless others. God will keep the income up if you keep the outgo up. But... um. Learn to be content. View God as good, your provider, and be thankful. View possessions not as the secret sauce of your contentment. The secret sauce to your contentment is Jesus. Being content in him, knowing that you are his, that he has redeemed you and saved you and called you his own, knowing what the future that God has for you. This season on earth, this short time on earth where your circumstances may be less than ideal pales in comparison to the glory that is awaiting you as a child of God. So I hope for those who aren't thieves, I'm thankful you're not. And I hope there's been some value and some blessing in how you view your good God. And in those days, those days like what I had Friday when circumstances go against you and you are tempted to be discontent, trust the good hand of God and be thankful. So God bless you. Look forward to seeing you next time.